When you study maths or philosophy or computer science, it's hard to avoid Turing machines. But what are Turing machines? How do they work? What have they got to do with computation? And how did they come to be this central concept in theoretical computer science? Let's have a look. everyone, welcome back to The Attic, welcome to Attic Philosophy. In this video, I'm going to be focusing in on Turing machines, what they are, how they work, and some of the developments they've been since Turing's time. A Turing machine is basically something like this. So we've got a tape. On the tape, we have ones and zeros written, and we might also have some spaces or some Bs for blanks. And the idea there is we can code any problem in mathematics in binary, strings of ones and zeros. Then we've got something that is going to read symbols on this tape one square at a time. So this little box here, it's going to run up and down the tape and it's going to look at one square at a time. And it's got a state. And you can just think of that as a number, like imagine a big wheel with all numbers around it. And that records what state this machine's in. Okay, so what does this machine do? It has a program. And the program has a number of instructions in it, and they're basically super simple. They say things like this. If you're in state number 152 and you're looking at a zero, then do the following things. Maybe you're going to change the zero to a one. So the Turing machine, it can, it can rub out and write new symbols on the tape. It can move. It can move left or it can move right. And then it can move into a new state. Okay, so if we imagine this state as a big wheel with counters on it, you basically just kind of move the wheel round until you're in state number 381 or whatever. Super, super simple. But Turing's idea was anything that can be done by any algorithm can be done by a machine like this, by a Turing machine. Now, that's not something you can prove. So that's called the Church-Turing hypothesis. Anything that can be computed can be computed by a Turing machine. Pretty much everyone believes that that's true. The notion of computation is kind of informal. There isn't an exact definition. You can think of this as a definition of computation. OK, this, what the Turing machine's doing, that is what computation is. And then it becomes uh, not just a hypothesis, but a theorem. So that's what Alan Turing did way back in 1936. It was in his paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidung's problem. But what's become of Turing machines since then? OK, let's have a look. I described a Turing machine written out in binary. OK, you've got ones and zeros and blanks separating out the numbers. But it turns out we don't really need to do that. These are representing numbers and we could represent those numbers just like this. OK, so we could represent the number two just by putting two dashes, the number four, four dashes, the number one with one dash, and we've got blanks in between them. So really, we only need one symbol in our Turing machines, plus some way of marking the blank symbols. So that's sometimes called tally notation. Let's see how we can use it to calculate some stuff using a Turing machine, and then we'll see some improvements. So suppose we start off with three and four on our tape, and we want to add them together. What are we going to do? Well, what we could do is we could start off here. So our Turing machine starts off here, and it's going to shuffle down to the right till it sees a blank, and then it's going to go one more to the right. It's going to erase this, go back to the left, and write it in here. So essentially, we're going to take each one of these and move it one place to the left, and then we're going to end up with seven dashes written on our tape. So we've added three to four. OK, that's pretty simple. What about if we wanted to multiply the numbers? So three multiplied by four. Well, there, we're going to want to repeat add three. So we're going to add three to itself four times. But here's where things get a bit tricky, because if we start fiddling around with this bit of the tape, how are we going to remember that it's three that we're adding four times? OK, this machine hasn't got any memory. We need some way of recording that. So one way we could do it is like this. We start off like this and then we copy this information onto a different bit of the tape or we just shift to a different bit of the tape and start writing out our answer there. So we don't destroy this information when we start writing on the tape. That works great. However, 
it's going to be very inefficient because what a Turing machine's got to do is it's got to start off here and it's got to kind of go over here and say, okay, I'm going to do it four times. So what am I adding? Three. So I've got to go back here. Where am I writing my answer? All the way over here. There's lots and lots of shuffling back and forth on this tape just to do a really simple thing like multiplication. How could we avoid that? Well, here's a nice idea. We can take these three numbers on our tape and we can chop that tape up like this. So we can chop it into three bits or more bits if we need them. So we could start off with our numbers written on the tape and we could, in effect, dump three into this register, dump four into that register. And then we can go, OK, for the number we've got in this register, look at what's in that register and add it to itself. Each time, get rid of one of these. And when this one's empty, we're done with our answer on this tape. That's a much more efficient way of doing any kind of multiplication or any kind of computation. It doesn't give us a way of doing stuff we couldn't do before. We could have done all of this just on the one tape. It's just more efficient. In fact, it's not more space efficient. This will take up the same number of squares on the tape as doing it on one tape, but it's more time efficient. We do it in less steps because we don't have to keep shuffling back and forth, back and forth. Now, actually thinking about it this way links in really nicely with a different model of computation. So to build up to it, imagine that we took took these three tapes and we turn them on their end like this. It's essentially exactly the same thing. But what we've got going on here now, imagine this as just a pile of three things. That's a pile of four things. And that's a pile of however many things we're putting in our answer. It could be a pile of anything. Could be a pile of rocks. We've got three rocks here, four rocks here. And this is our answer pile of rocks. So basically now what we're saying is take three rocks and put three more rocks on top and repeat that however many rocks you got here times, that's multiplication. These are called abacus machines or register machines, and they give us an alternative model of computation. But if you think about it, this is basically the same as this, which is the same as this, which is the same as this, our old friend, the Turing machine. OK, so register machines, abacus machines equivalent to the Turing machine. There's lots of different models of computation that actually amount to the same thing. Turing had this hypothesis that if you can do a any kind of computation, you can do it on a Turing machine. What evidence is there for that? Why is why don't we believe that there is some way of computing stuff that Turing machines can't do? Well, here's the evidence. There are lots of different models of computation. There's Turing machines, there's register machines like we just looked at, random access machines, kind of like the register machines. And there's recursive functions. This comes from Alonzo Church. So this is the idea that we can take a really simple function like adding one. And there's ways of combining functions like that. Basically, we repeat them. So repeated added one gives us addition. Adding two numbers and repeated addition gives us multiplication. Repeated multiplication gives us exponentiation. Repeat that, we've got super exponentiation. Add in a bit more stuff and we've got the recursive functions. It's a different model of computation. And it turns out we can prove they are all the same. That is, they compute the same class of functions. They do it in different ways. Some are more efficient for, diff for different things than others, but they give us the same results at the end of the day. That's our evidence for saying, yeah, Turing got it right. If any function is computable, you can do it on a Turing machine. So I'm going to wrap up now with what I think I've learned from Turing machines. They're so simple. It's such a simple idea. This thing, it just does really simple things, but it keeps on doing enough of them and it can build up to really amazing, complex calculations. Whatever you do in life, you're probably at some point going to be hit with a problem that you don't understand. It's super complex. How are you going to deal with that? Well, you've just got to remember, you've got to break it down into its super simple little steps. Each one of those you can understand. And you've just got to have enough determination to do enough of those simple steps to build up to the big thing. And I think this applies to the to the really big issues in life. Social inequality, there's going to be climate change. They can sometimes seem overwhelming. How do you deal with those? Well, you've just got to break them down into the really simple little steps and take enough of those little steps until you've solved the problem. OK, so there we have Turing machines. I hope you found this interesting. If you've got any comments, leave me a question down below. Thank you so much for watching. If you've been enjoying these videos, why not subscribe to the channel? Hit the bell icon to get updates. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys back here soon. Oh,